Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, welcome back to the ninth lecture of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. So in this lecture, uh, we are going to do a quick recap of a very important topic that we, that we started uh, you know, uh, last time, which was uh, the implications or the consequences of spatial autocorrelation for statistical estimation of mean and its confidence bands, right? So uh, very quickly, uh, since it's a very important topic, uh, you know, what we started wa with was a, uh, an IID uh, sequence of uh, values Z1 till Zn. So we have a sequence of data points from Z1 till Zn and uh, they are independently and identically distributed sequence of random variables from a Gaussian distribution having unknown population mean mu and a variance sigma squared, okay? And we said that the minimum variance unbiased estimator of mu was nothing but uh, Z bar. So we said that Z bar is our best guess of what, you know, uh, the population mean would be. And then we also said that, look, once you, uh, once you construct this Z bar, it is a function of these random entities Zi's and hence Z bar is itself a random variable. So if z bar is a random variable, then it must have a possibility of error. That is to say that as a statistician, I cannot really say that, you know, I, I've, I've known z bar with 100% certainty. There's going to be some error, some uncertainty around what this z bar value can take. And on your screens, uh, you can see that if z bar is distributed normally because it's a function of standard uh, of normally distributed random variable z i's so z bar is also normally distributed its population mean is mu right that's the expectation of z bar which is what we are using to uh, you know uh, to to get a sense or a best guess of mu itself and its variance is sigma squared by n so in previous lecture we established that if you have iid random variables which are themselves, uh, you know, uh, uh, normally distributed with variance sigma squared, then the sample mean has variance sigma squared by n. So it has a smaller variance than each individual uh, random variable by itself. Then we can write out the 95% confidence interval for Z bar. That is the, you know, we have, uh, 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 we are, 95% sure that Z bar will lie between this interval that is Z bar minus 1.96 sigma by root n and Z bar plus 1.96 uh, uh, times sigma by root n, right? So what we are saying is that we have a sequence of values uh, Z1 to Zn, you know, distributed across a real number line. Here is a real number line, right? And given these values, we have some distribution, uh, normal distribution, that is a bell curve, uh, which this, uh, which each Zi follows. So we have Zi's, we have Z1, say Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, and so on and so forth, okay? So Z bar is nothing but the mean of these values. So it's going to be, you know, around the central tendency of these values. Now Z bar can take, uh, you know, uh, values which are in this range of Z bar minus, minus 1.96 sigma by root n and plus uh, on the right hand side of Z bar 1.96 sigma by root n, right? So what we say is that Z bar will lie in this middle area with probability 95% okay, or 0.95. This is the case for uh, the IID uh, distributed uh, sequence of data. So this is for 
I, I, D. Very, very important. And then we sort of relax this assumption of I, I, D and we say, say all these ZIs are not independent of each other. They are somehow spatially dependent. That is to say that if I am able to observe, if I realize Z1, that is Z value of Z at location 1, then I can know something about Z2, right? Because Z1 and Z2 are dependent on each other and more specifically, they are spatially dependent on each other, right? So they are covarying together. So covariance is uh, an indicator or a measure of linear relationship. So we have this structure of spatial dependence covariance zi comma zj is equal to sigma naught square times rho to the power of modulus i minus j. So this modulus absolute value of modulus of or, or the modulus of i minus j is nothing but a metric of distance, a measure of distance uh, between these uh, locations i and j. Remember the covariance, the covariance, the way the measure to which or the degree to which zi and zj move together, which is what covariance is telling me, is a function or is a virtue of their respective locations and not the values by themselves, right? So the covariance structure only, matter, only depends on the locations between and the difference of these locations i and j, right? So this is a very specific rather a restrictive form of spatial dependence structure, but a very good point to start with, okay? Uh, and also we are saying that, look, these are positively correlated, that is rho is between uh, zero and one. If rho were a negative number, then these numbers, uh, you know, these, these entities would be spatially negatively correlated, okay? Uh, so if I see a very high realization in, in at a particular location on the real number line, it's quite likely that, you know, the neighboring values are also likely to be higher values rather than, uh, you know, uh, values on the lower side, right? So what we are saying is if we, if we want to sort of visualize the problem, we again have our real number line and we have our, you know, uh, ZIs distributed across this real number line. You know, we can just say Z at location 1, Z at location 2, Z at location 3, at location 4, keep going till z at location n, okay? So once I, am, once I have these, uh, you know, have these values, uh, the, the spatial uh, dependence structure is telling me that once I get to know z3, there is some dependence of z3 with z4. So whatever value I realize at location three will have a dependence spillover on z4 and also a dependence spillover on z2, okay? Because two and three and three or four and three and four are equidistant, uh, equidistant. That is the the unit of distance between these two is one. The spillover, the degree of spillover, is going to be exactly the same. That is what the covariance structure is telling me, right? Or the spatial dependence structure is telling me, right? The deep, the spillover of Z three on Z Z five and Z one will be slightly smaller because now we will have rho, rho, uh, you know, raised to the, to the power two, right? So rho now has a power two, rho is between zero and one. So rho squared is certainly smaller than, uh, uh, you know, rho, okay? So the spillover, the degree of spillover that is attained from on locations that are farther away from Z3 is going to become smaller and smaller and rather it's going to be exponentially smaller because the distance is on the exponent of rho, right? All right, so that is, uh, that, that I believe is well understood. So with this correlation structure, I've just written down some of the covariant, covariances uh, between different locations as examples, covariance of Z1 and Z1, which is nothing but the variance of Z1, again, something that we studied in the, in the last lecture. Right? And then covariance of Z1 and Z2 is rho sigma is not squared, rho to the power one, that is one minus two, absolute value, right? And then you have uh, covariance Z1 and Z3, like I said, when, you, when three is two positions away from one, the degree of spillover is going to be of the order of rho squared because you know the exponent is simply uh, absolute value of one minus three and so on. Right? So this is how my, uh, my, my, my structure 
is 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 uh, is given. By the way, this also means there's some there's one more piece of information here is that not only three is going to have a spillover on one, one is also going to have a spillover on three, and just like that. Uh, one is also going to have a spillover on two, two is also going to have a spillover on one, and so on and so forth, right? So in space, when we do spatial analysis, every location impacts what is happening at every other location. And on the other hand, every location is also impacted by what is occurring at all other locations in the domain of our study, right? How would we, how would these, uh, you know, impacts uh, be defined, what will be their measures, how strong they will be, will all depend on the spatial dependent structure as specified mathematically. Okay, so these, these devices, spatial dependent structures, this is a device covariance uh, 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 offers, the covariance operator offers a device to specify the spatial dependence uh, structure. Okay, all right. Uh, just a little note before we sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, before we sort of move on to the final conclusion of this exercise, that uh, this spatial uh, autocorrelation structure is quite similar to the autoregressive time series or serial correlation structure of first order, which is called as the AR1 structure, right? So, which is, I mean, this is not, this is not very surprising. If I were to take these indices 1 to n, instead of space, if I were to take them as time, right? So if I take time equals one, two, three, four, keep going till n, or I could use the notation t, it's just notation, right? All I'm saying is I am realizing values at each time period t, right? So then I have a, a, a timeline which goes from one, two, three, four, all the way till n, and I am able to, you know, uh, 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 specify random variables at each location that are, uh, which will have realization Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on and so forth. The autoregressive structure uh, with, with, uh, of order one, which is called AR1, basically specifies that every value uh, that, that we observe at a given time period has a spillover from the previous period, like right? so, so for example, habit persistence, right? So if we look at, uh, you know, credit card, uh, you know, uh, uh, spending of a average, you know, uh, 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 credit card user, then it's quite likely that the, the, the amount of spending that we observe today, a lot of it would be explained by what they were doing in the previous month or in that month in the previous year. Right, the kind of consumption, uh, you know, pattern that we would observe uh, for any for for uh, for someone in a in a cafeteria, will a lot of it will be explained by uh, you know what they were consuming uh, the, in the previous visit to the cafeteria. So the idea of the AR1 structure is that there is this one period lag spillover that happens every time period as we sort of as time moves on. Right, so, so, so we have a similar thing going on with spatial. However, in case of spatial, as we have seen that, you know, the spillovers can also go in the other direction, which is not the case with time series, right? So, so what happens at time period two cannot impact what happens at time period one because time period one came before time period two, right? So the, the spillover impacts are unidirectional, they, are, they can only happen in a direction. That is a fundamental difference between time series analysis and spatial analysis. Another fundamental difference between spatial data and time series data is that when we talk of forecasting, right? So if this were a time series forecasting exercise, then a typical query would be, what is the value of Z at time period one? So, you know, for a central bank, for a, for a, uh, you know, a, 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 a uh, you know, a finance mach machinery of any country or a state, the idea is, can you forecast what would be the GDP growth in the subsequent time period, right? So I've observed GDP of India from, uh, you know, right from independence to, uh, let's say, till 2021 or 2022. And I want to now predict what will be the GDP growth rate for 2023. So I have a time series of data and I want to predict what will happen in the next step, right? In case of spatial analysis, right? 
uh, we we don't necessarily have to have to hop on one unit, right? Spatial forecasting is is as good as to be done at a point like let's say three by two. Any location on the real number line is a valid forecasting point, obviously including n plus one, right? So 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 that's that's the that's the difference between uh, spatial data and time series data. Right? If time series started at Z1, Z0, we cannot go in the retrospect and say, what was the GDP of India in 1945 using the time series from let's say 1948 or 1950. Right? It is not possible to go back, but in case of space, you know, that is a valid query. Right? That's, that's, that's the difference between spatial analysis and time series analysis. Okay. So we showed last time that under uh, you know, spatial correlation, uh, now, what changes is the variance of Z bar. So Z bar remains the a consistent estimator of mu, but the variance of Z bar is no longer sigma squared by n. Rather, it is a uh, it is a value which is sigma squared by n times one plus rho over one minus rho. And in the previous lecture, we also said that we could set this value n one minus rho over one plus rho equals some value n prime. So we could sort of re-specify this variable into a more concise n prime or n tilde variable, and then sort of, sort of try and contrast between the variance of Z bar in the IID case and in the case when we have spatially dependent data, right? So, and, and we said, what we found was this, that, that this n prime, which is the new effective you know, strength of data, if we were to represent variance of Z bar as it appears in the IID case, then this n prime will be effectively smaller than n. And, and I said in the, in the previous lecture that what this really means is that because of dependence in data, because of spatial dependence in data, the effective or net information available to conduct our analysis is smaller than you know the unique data points or unique points where you have realizations because all these points are to a degree dependent on each other so they effectively contain an information set which is smaller than the the quanta that you see in terms of the number of realizations that is n right this is very interesting but also quite intuitive okay so so we we, we learned that there is bias in variance of z bar if we ignore spatial independence and, and indeed the data has that, uh, you know, exhibits that kind of a structure. Of course, if there is bias, bias in variance of z bar, there is also bias in standard deviation of z bar, uh, you know, which is nothing but, uh, sorry about that, uh, which is nothing but uh, the square root, the square root of variance of z bar. Right? So if there is bias in variance of z bar, then there is bias in standard deviation of z bar. And can we quantify this bias? Of course we can quantify this bias. Well, this bias will be nothing but the true value of uh, you know, uh, variance of z bar is um, 1 plus rho sigma squared times 1 plus rho over uh, sigma uh, n times 1 minus rho minus what you would have thought if you took the data to be IID and they were spatially dependent. So if you ignore spatial dependence, uh, this value here is the quantum of bias that you're going to uh, have to uh, work with, right? And in the other case in, case, in case of standard deviation, well, it will be the square root of sigma squared one plus rho over n times one minus rho minus square root of sigma squared by n. Right? So this is the bias in standard deviation of, uh, you know, of Z bar. This then leads to the bias in the 95% confidence interval, right? And what we said last time is because N prime is smaller, uh, is smaller than N, the confidence interval, the 95% interval where, where in which I, I believe Z bar or the mean will lie for this given population, this confidence interval is larger, 
right so to be to be able to attain a a a a you know a confidence to the extent of 95 percent out of 100 times z bar will lie in this range that range will become slightly larger right so there is a little bit more error in the data and the reason is because you have effectively smaller set of information because of all these dependent values and it will turn out that as the value of rho increases that is spatial dependence increases n prime which is the effective size of data set independent uh, data points will become smaller and smaller and the variance of z bar will become larger and larger and hence the confidence interval will also become larger and larger all right so you guys can sort of uh, you know uh, uh, you guys should do some kind of, uh, a thought exercise on this uh, you know uh, before you move, move forward a 2 minute thought exercise will help you uh, under, understand this concept better okay all right so let's move forward so uh, let's try and do an example or an exercise to understand the concept, the dependence on rho of this bias of, of in variance of z bar and the confidence interval of z bar uh, of that is a sample mean, uh, 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 you know, for a given, uh, 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 you know, sequence of data, uh, size of data set and a given value of rho. Uh, so let's, let's read the question. Uh, Consider a sequence of 10 data values. So now I have n equals 10. That is the apparent quantum of information. I have values observed or realized at 10 locations in space. Z1 till Z10 indexed by their location on a real number line. Okay. All these ZIs, it's not an apostrophe, sorry about that. All these ZIs exhibit a spatial dependence structure which you have already seen before and you have a, an understanding of, 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 of from earlier. Um, and now we are given rho is about 0.3, okay. Now rho could go between 0 and 1 if they are positively spatially correlated, right. So we still have positive spatial correlation and we have rho equals 0.26 and we are asked to evaluate an equivalent number of observations that would exhibit spatial independence given the 10 spatially dependent observations having rho equals 0.26 okay and this spatial dependence structure which is covariance zi zj is equal to sigma squared times rho to the power absolute value of i minus j right and i and j are simply locations of data index in this re on this real number line and i and j can only go from 1 and 10 1 to 10 okay and the second query is evaluate the spatial autocorrelation impacts on 95 uh, percent confidence bounds for z bar okay so we have we have we have a pretty good understanding of these things now so let's look at the first question the first question is basically asking you what is n prime which is the effective uh, you know amount or quanta of data that would be independent, spatially independent would bring to the table, you know, uh, that this, these 10 values would bring, uh, uh, you know, all together at once. So we have, we know that for question one, n prime is nothing but n times one minus rho over one plus rho, okay. So I have n is 10, one minus 0.26 over one plus 0.26 which if you solve, you will find that it is equal to six, okay? So there are six, there, are e there is an equivalent of six independent observations that this data set, you know, provides as far as the information that it brings to the table in order to estimate the un unknown population mean mu, okay? Of course, we know that Z bar will still be summation, you know, i equals 1 to 10, z i divided by 10. But the variance of z bar will be sigma squared over, uh, you know, uh, uh, n prime, n prime, which is 6. So we have sigma squared over 6, okay? And that implies the standard deviation of z bar the standard deviation of z bar 
is equal to uh, uh, sigma over square root of 6 that is n prime, right? And this value will sort of, or you know, uh, so, so this value is what is going to be used to now construct the 95% confidence bounds for Z bar. So the 95% confidence bounds for Z bar are given as Z bar minus 1.96 into sigma over square root of 6 comma Z bar plus 1.96 into sigma over square root of 6. Okay. What would be the confidence bounds for the IID case? Okay. So for IID case, uh, we will have Z bar minus 1.96 sigma over root 10, okay, times Z bar plus 1.96 times sigma over root 10, okay. And, and if you were to sort of, if you want to contrast the IID case with the spatially dependent data set that we, uh, that we have here, then you can rewrite the the confidence bound in a more convenient form, you can say Z bar minus 1.96 times 1 1.3 uh, into sigma over root 10, okay, comma Z bar plus 1.96 times 1 1.3 sigma over root 10, okay, this is 1.3 here. I suppose you will understand this is 1.3, okay, all right. So, so what this really means is that the, the confidence bands are 30% longer on, on, on each side uh, from, the, from the Z bar if you were to transition from the IID case to the spatially dependent case uh, as given in this question. And remember this is because of the value of rho. If the value of rho increases, if it were to increase, you would have seen an even greater, you know, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, uh, extension of the confidence bounds. So, so just to visualize it very quickly, what we are saying is that we are given this data on the real number line. The data are all Gaussian in nature, right? So they are all following this uh, Gaussian distribution. In one case, they are spatially dependent. In another case, they are spatially independent. Right, so I have different data points, 1, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, Z6, and keep going all the way till Zn. Here it's 10, so n equals 10, right? And what we are saying is that, you know, the consistent estimator of Z bar will be exactly the same both for the IID case and also for spatially dependent case. Right? So we are saying that they will be exactly the same for both the cases, right? What will differ though is the variance of Z bar and by extension, the standard deviation of Z bar and the confidence bounds of Z bar. So for the IID case, I would have to go 1.96 times the standard deviation. So Z bar minus 1.96 times uh, sigma over root n and on the left and equal distance on the right, that is uh, 1.96 Z bar plus 1.96 sigma over root n. So my confidence bounds for the IID case are in black ink, which is the, which is the 95% confidence interval for Z bar, okay? The hashed area under the bell curve, okay? And if I had, instead I had, you know, I had spatially dependent data, what happens is that my bounds sort of shift rightward on the right hand side by a factor of 1.3. So it is 30% higher, right? So what I do is that I extend the right hand side bound by 30%. So, you know, I have, I'm gonna do it approximately. I'm gonna extend it by about, about this much. So I'm going to take it forward 
and I'm gonna take it till here. I'm gonna say this here is Z bar plus 1.96 times 1.3 sigma over root n, okay, which is 10, so n is just 10. So I hope you'll be clear on that. And I'll try to go about the same. This figure is not to scale, so pardon me for that, but I suppose it makes the point. Okay, so now the area under the bell curve that I am representing using the blue ink is the 95% confidence interval or confidence bound for, uh, you know, that is, that's the, uh, there's 95% probability that Z bar will lie between these two values in blue ink on the blue ink markers on the real number line. And the area that you're looking at will now start to sort of uh, provide me a 95% uh, probability under spatially dependent, uh, you know, structure. Okay, so um, so that's that's about it. Um, uh, so so now we are going to sort of move on to a two-dimensional case and study, uh, you know, uh, uh, spatial dependence and its consequences on estim on on mean estimator uh, 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 as a next step. Okay, all right.